let's look at verse uh, 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there, been thus now a long time, he saith. So it, it seems that there was something that precipitated Jesus saying something to this guy, this certain man. It didn't just, he didn't just randomly seem, I mean, sometimes God seems random and he's not. But it, it gives the explanation of why he spoke to him. It says that he knew that he had been there a long time. And um, I wrote, when Jesus knew that he'd been thus now a long time, some of us have been in the same place for a long time. It's time to find another church. Just kidding. Just kidding. No, I'm not talking about that. I mean spiritually. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, both are true in this situation because he didn't really respond with faith, like, "Oh, I was waiting for you." It was kind of he—he was still looking to man. So our last class kind of brought out the fact of uh, the length of time sometimes helps us to recognize that, you know, hey man, we need some help. You know, what I wrote was um, we get in a rut. And the bad thing is, is that a lot of times when you get in a rut, you can be eventually, you know, when you first get in a rut, it's kind of frustrating, but you know, you can eventually get find security in it, you know. And uh, I think this is what a lot of people do is they, they um, not because it's so secure, but it is because they've been there so long, they have a sense of security about it. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so um, I think that, that the Lord is, I, I think that the Lord is very dynamic. He's always, want, he's always alive. He's always moving. But I think that, um, I think he's trying to keep us moving but I think that we're not really that in tune with the Lord and so we get steeped in these ruts and then we find security and then God has to come along and really shake our boat you know and that's the grace of God that does that you know we you know imagine imagine somebody who has gotten in a rut and he's been there a long time, a long, 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 long time. So right about here, he's been in it so long and found security in it that right about here he begins to have major fear because he knows something's going to come along and shake his security in that rut. So he begins to fear that something bad is going to happen. Okay. But can, get it grip, man. Something bad isn't about to happen. God's fixing to get you out of your old steep ways. You know what I mean? He's fixing to move so that you're not stuck in false security and you're not stuck in old paths that don't lead to anything anymore. But our fear is that, uh, and the reason why fear would come is because the fear is related to the security of this, not the reality of it, not the presence of God in it, not the things of God about it. There is nothing that we have found that is of the Lord. It is simply a security that somehow brings, you know, because none of that is the Lord. So it's not the Lord. There's not a comfort from the Lord. It is a fear of losing the security that has brought something to our flesh because we don't like change, you know. But I tell you what, you know, we need to, we, we, are, we are changing, we need to change, we need to, uh, I guess the first step is that we need to realize that we need to change, that God does shake up things. You know, he, uh, he never leaves things just the same. He is always shaking up things. And if you, if you keep your eyes on him, then, and you recognize that everything he does is for the greater good, and he's always working towards that, you're not as fearful as if, you see, there it goes back to God's not for me. And when he does something, he's, it's going to 
prove out to be against me and against what I really want. And against, You see what I mean? There's that mentality again. It's a strong mentality. And it, it's more prevalent than I think many of us realize. So, so, so the first thing is just to realize how God is and that, that every change, when the change comes, all he's doing is getting you out of the rut, taking you to the higher ground, you know? I mean, when it rains, when it floods, what's the first thing to fill up? The ruts. He takes you to higher ground, you know? He takes you out of the storm and out of it, but then, you know, well, we don't know that. We don't realize that the rut keeps you in a certain boundaries and a rut fills up and a rut fills up and gets wet and then you get stuck, you know, not just I'm in the rut, but now I'm stuck in this one place in this rut, you know, because it's all slippery and muddy and whatever. You know, we don't even, re we don't realize the, the drawbacks. We just realize that, hey, I'm comfortable, don't rock my boat, you know, and because if you change things, then I'm not going to like it, you know. And that is just a strong, strong, I mean, you know, and I don't mean, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm telling you what the Adam nature is. This isn't personal. <laughs> uh, it is just a strong, strong identification and stand against the Lord. It is, you know. Well, you can do it and you'll do it and you, you mess up and you can do it for years. God still loves you and I love you and, you know, the you know, he'll work to change that. But I believe that we can, we can work with God. We can be workers together with God. We don't always have to be acted upon. We don't always have to just choose the flesh and trust God to get me out of the flesh. You know what I mean? I mean, I, now I think that's what some of us do. We just say, okay, well, if it's all by grace and this and that, I choose the flesh and I trust God to get me out of the flesh. But I think part of what he's doing is not just to get us out of the flesh in the sense of the fleshly situations and ruts that we're in, but the flesh that got us in those situations to get us out of agreement with that and to, and to say, man, you know, I do not want what my flesh wants. And I really believe that there comes a time where you do take a stand against yourself with God. I believe there must be a time. That's nothing more that, than your spirit. That is the dividing of your soul and your spirit. But, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's that old deal. You know, you choose yes for the flesh, 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 and then something big come on for God, and you'll choose yes for the flesh. You just get in the habit. You know, you need to learn if, you know, you need to learn to say no to your flesh sometimes. Amen. Amen. Well, if we think there's virtue in the process and that, you know, that somehow there's, that that's it and that God, you know, this is part of the process and God's going to reach down and he's going to break me. And, but you see, if you are going with the flesh in that process, then when you reach down and he, he doesn't break you, you break. You do realize that, don't you? He doesn't break you. You break. He bring a situation. And how you react to that is you'll either break and go, oh, God, I need you. And because of that response, you will find the Lord as sufficient and he will come through you and come to you and do all of those things. Or you will have the situation happen. And even that situation, because it, maybe he does lift you up to a higher situation, but because you didn't break, you're no different on th this plane up here than you were on this plane. Basically, you're still waiting for God to come do something to you. Instead of realizing there's a time and a place where you move with the Lord. Uh -huh.
Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. That's right. We, I mean, in reality, all he's done is come shake up our little thing, but we haven't changed, basically, even though the, the road isn't the same now. It's a different dealing, and so he goes, okay, well, I'll just deal with you differently, hoping, but we basically <laughs> remain the same. And so then, okay, well, it's going to go up in this direction, and you, you know what I mean? And so we're, you know, the real issue that sends us in another direction does not change us. I mean, though that's what he's trying to get. He's trying to get us to go, well, I'm, I'm not able. I am not sufficient. I need you, Lord. And uh, this is probably a bad example, but I'll, I'll try to give it. It's like, a, it's like a very stiff reed, you know, that says, okay, I don't want to go into the storm over here. I don't want to go into the storm over here because the winds will blow against me. And I will be unbending, and I'll probably get broken, not in a good way. You know what I mean? Not brokenness, but, you know. So, I make the decision not to go that direction because that's where the storm, that's where the winds of the Holy Spirit are strong. Or that's where the storms are, okay? Because I know me, and I know, and what's the use? I'll wait till God changes me, and then I'll go into the situation, and I'll be perfect. Okay. But in some ways, what happens is God gets you into this situation when you're still, and he begins to work on you, and you begin to feel the pressure, and you begin to realize that you cannot stand against this thing, and you are unable, and your recognition of that begins to work, and you begin to cry out to the Lord, O oh, wretched man that I am, I need you, Lord. When I am weak, then I am I strong. Because in my, and by my weakness is your strength made perfect in me. You know, things like that. And so what happens is you, become, you, be, you begin to be a flex, you become more flexible because you're not demanding your way. The stiffness was, I want my way, or do you understand what I mean? You're not demanding your way. You, and by going all and acknowledging your sin, you know, your inability, you're this and that, the storm may be situations where before you'd have been real critical of people because they were messed up. Now you realize your weakness, and it's funny because you see yourself as this stiff thing, but by recognizing your weakness, you're not so quick to judge. You're actually, in God's eyes, becoming a reed that the spirit wind can blow over you and not destroy you and you flow with the movement of the spirit of God instead of rigid and fighting against it. Does that help a little bit? <laughs> you know? Ricky? Ricky's Ricky or Randy's Randy. But what we tend to do is say, this wind or this pressure is not the Lord get me out of this. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of saying, this stiffness. And then we don't see what he's trying to show. Right. Well, I remember going to a season where I'd hear somebody teach even similar stuff like this, and I'd go, I would have, the, the flesh was in control of me. 
And the flesh justified and said all this stuff and had an answer for everything. And da -da -da -da. you know what I mean? It was really amazing how, you know, this doesn't apply to me. And I mean, I, it's, it's, like, it's like trying to nail jello to a tree, you know? I mean, I remember. The, and then going, oh, you know, oh, no, you know, and, you know, and I could dodge the best, man. And, and, and then by reading the scripture and people sharing and things, I began to realize that the very thoughts that I was having that was excusing and saying, that, you know, coming up with an answer to all this stuff was the flesh. <laughs> it's the very thing that, you know, it don't want to go to the cross. You know what I mean? That's the flesh. And then I realized that my God, like Paul said in Romans 7, he says, I see then a law that when I would do good, this thing wants to do evil. And he said, then it's no more I. Then he began to, he began to acknowledge, he began to separate himself from flesh. The end result was he began to identify himself in Christ. But, you know, there is this period of time where a person goes through and, you know, I mean, they can answer anything. I mean, I know you can, you know, oh, well, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, you can even kind of go, yeah, that's right. But for me, I'm not, or I don't even know what. I just remember how, for me, it was like this dodging and answering and coming up with all this stuff. But there came a day when I, w I wanted to take every bit of guilt that was due me. I didn't want to hide anymore. I wanted to go, I I'm guilty. I'm guilty because it would bring me to a place where I would say, I need the Lord and really need the Lord, not this, I need you, Lord, because I'm going through a hard time. And the heart... You, you know, see, this is different, and we don't understand this, but we go through a hard time, and our flesh doesn't like it, so we say, I need you, Lord, because we feel needy in the flesh, but we're, the flesh is going to stay. But we feel needy, so we say, I need you, Lord, come through like what Randy's been teaching or something. But the flesh has no intention of changing or leaving or submitting. It's The flesh is saying, I need you, Lord. Because it wants this to quit glowing or whatever, but for whatever reason. But it's not saying, that's not you saying, I need you, Lord, and I need you. To, if it means break this flesh, do whatever you have to do, you bring it down. Uh, expose, you know, and see, the Lord never exposes. But I think we have to willing to say, willing, be willing to say, Lord, expose me if that be the case. Make me the, Paul said, I'm less than the least of all saints. And to become the worst means, hey, man, you got nowhere to go but up. Uh, that don't sound good to you, but it sounded great to me because I thought, well, you know, that, you might as well just drop all the way down. Then you haven't got anything to stand up for or justify or, <laughs> you know, make right or try to uh, talk somebody into accepting or whatever. They all just say, you're a jerk. You don't know nothing. You, you're a mess. And then you go, yes, I'm a jerk. I don't know nothing. I'm a mess. Lord help me. And you just stay right there and everybody confirms it, you know. Until one day God raises you up because he giveth grace. But he don't give it to the proud that are sitting there going, you know, in their pride going, I want this storm to stop. I need you, Lord. But that's pride, you know. He gives it to the humble. And that's one who goes, my God, I am not, and I am tired. And, you know, and, you know some of you have already got to the place where if somebody pats you on the back, you kind of go, don't do that. But you haven't got to the place where you, when you pat you on the back, you go, don't do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know. So, and I would say that's progress. I'm not condemning that. I'm just saying, you know, I, I consider that progress. But, but we're still heading toward, you know, it's just hard to understand that there's, there's either one or two places to identify in this scripture. I mean, there's actually several. You can be one of the multitude who never gets help and never gets touched. Or you can become impotent. You can become so needy that you that God that Jesus will show up because He only fills the empty. He doesn't fill the full. He only heals the sick. You know, and that's who He came for, and that's who ended up around Him, and that's the ones that responded to Him, and the wise, and the together, or the self-justifying, which is nothing but a Pharisee was against Jesus and would end up hanging him on the cross, not for their sins, but for his. And he never sinned. I mean, that's how far the justification can go. And, and so, 
And then ultimately, then once you're there, the Lord comes and touches you, heals you, then you begin to identify in Christ. Now you're in Christ. You're the one that is sent. You're his hand extended to go among the poor and the needy and to preach this word and to be there for them. You see what I mean? I mean, you're, you're going to identify somewhere. But we always, you know, we want to pick the best spot, not realizing we're not truly identifying there. We're just saying, oh, that's me. But that may not be me. We have to identify with it. And to identify with being the impotent man, you have to be impotent. Meaning, no, you know, no strength. Um, let me read a little more here. Only someone who's been there a long time is open to Jesus. Because somebody that just got laid out there, they still got hope in somebody getting them down there real fast. Getting put in the water. This guy's made the trip many a time, and he said, people always get put in before me. Always. It's happened over and over. I've been here 38 years. I ain't got no hope in this method. So he's open to the Lord. Even with deliverance at hand, meaning the angel that was there to move. In other words, there was the possibility of deliverance. He said, I still can't do it. Did you catch it? He says, I try, I get down there, somebody else gets in front. Even with deliverance at hand, he says, I can't do it. That's not in me and I'm not able. But it's not, well, bless God, it's not in me, I ain't able. God, you're just going to have to move. That's flesh saying, you're going to have to move for my flesh. He lives at a place of utter helplessness, which is not bad. It's good. You know what? We, we want to experience this thing so we can get the heck out of it, this place of utter hopelessness and helplessness. We want to experience that so we can get the heck out of it so we'll never experience it again. I got news for you. Once you experience it, it will never leave you that you're that way, but he's this way. The only difference is you change who you trust in. It's good. You change who you trust in. You go, ah, there ain't no hope. You don't go, you don't go, there ain't no hope. Come on, show me. And so I won't ever have to worry about this again. You'll always know there's no hope anywhere else but Christ. And he'll be your source from then on. In a real way, not just kind of a religious way. Uh-huh. That's right. Yeah, I've got that in my notes here, too. There's no man. Um, I wrote, when Jesus came along, Jesus didn't put him in the pool. You know, I mean, I'd, well, I'm here. You know, I need, and this is the way we do it. Here's the answer. Here's the person needing the answer. And here's the one going to help me get to it, Jesus. The answer is the pool and the angel, and I'm here looking for the answer, and Jesus being my helper. Folks, Jesus ain't your helper. He's supposed to be the answer. We need to quit looking to Jesus to help us, because most of the time that help us is help our flesh. <clears throat> we must, um, when Jesus came along, he didn't put him in the pool. To the man and to a, us, it would appear that this was the way to meet the need. Rush him down there real quick. Knock everybody else out of the way. That's the spirit of the Lord. But hey, I've got a need, so it's okay. I've got a need, so it's okay. I'm after the Lord, so it's okay. I'm trying to get healing so I can help others. So if I knock you out of the way in the process, it's okay. No, it ain't. The means and the end are the same. You cannot come into agreement with selfish, sinful ways to reach God's end. You have to, as much as you can, every step of the way, let your steps be ordered of the Lord. Um, it would appear this would be the way to meet the need, but you have no need of a man. You have no need of a man. You have no need of a man to put you in the water because you ain't going to get healed that way. But even if you were, you don't have no need of a man because he ain't going to help you anyway. It's not going to happen that way. He didn't need a helper, and he didn't need a healing. He needed Jesus. 
And there is a difference. You know, we see our wretched state and we go, oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to help me? And Paul didn't say that. He said, who, who shall deliver me? And then he writes in Romans 6 uh, about this who, and he says, um, no, well, it's probably, yeah, Romans 6, know ye not that whom, to whom you yield your servants, members to obey, his servant ye are, to whom? whether of sin is a whom, the old man, Adam, or him, Christ, his servants. It's whom. It's a who that you yield unto. It's not, you know, and you're yielding to a who. Now, you don't know Adam, but I'll introduce him to you. If I had a mirror, I'd show him to you. You know, that's Adam. You know, that which is Adam, you know, that which is Randy is Adam. You know? That which is Debbie is flesh. That which is flesh is Letha. You know, any way you want to word it, but that which is Christ is Christ. And don't call flesh Jesus, and don't call Jesus flesh. Amen. That's right. That's, I, I wrote, the ones who were by the pool, though they were healed, the ones that got in the water first, were healed, weren't they? They never met Jesus. They never met Jesus. Well, healings, if your flesh is the goal, then healing's all you want, so who cares? But if Jesus is your goal, even if you get healed and you don't get with the Lord, you're not happy. You're not satisfied. And it doesn't truly bring satisfaction, ultimately. Um, have you ever seen somebody that was sick and or, or demon-possessed or whatever? I mean, I've seen this time and time again. And you pray for them and the Lord heals them, or you pray for them and they go through deliverance and they get delivered. And maybe they were coming to church week in and week out for, for you know, five years since they, they were got sick. You know, and every Sunday they were in service while they were sick. But once they got healed, after a few months, they filtered off and they didn't even go to church anymore. Anybody ever seen that? I've seen that over and over and over. And I came to the conclusion, deliverance is not the answer. Healing is not the answer. If a person will go after God, go after Jesus, that's the answer. And if they never get healed, they're better off than, than finding that as the answer. Uh -huh. Well, you notice, okay, here's, here's the person with the knee. Here's the pool. Here's Jesus. And let's say over here is a man that can help, you know. Do you know that if you don't have your priorities right, if you are identified with your flesh, if you are wanting your way and Jesus is a means to help you get what you want instead of Jesus what you want, then you are open to tremendous deception. And here's why. Because there are other sources 
that can answer your need for your flesh. But there's only one source that can answer your need for Jesus. Now, Jesus can also answer the needs of your flesh. But that's not, if that, if that becomes the primary thing, then he's no different than taking any one of these others. And I've seen people come to Jesus and say, okay, meet this need, meet this need. I love you. I love the Lord and everything. And, you know, they're trusting the Lord and everything. And, and they didn't get what they wanted. They didn't get healed or they didn't get their husband shaped up or they didn't get, you know, a, you know, a multitude of different things. And so something else came along, some new thing, you know, whether it's new age or whether it's uh, somebody's uh, television infomercial that will renew your marriage or that will, you know, this vitamin will do it or whatever. Uh, because they had not attached to Jesus, they had only attached to him for something and they had been a long time with him and he didn't meet what they wanted. Then they became open to something else when it came along. And let me tell you, the enemy knows this about human beings. He knows this, and he will exploit you. He will exploit you. And, um, you know, there has to be, and if you don't have it, all you got to do is ask for it, but there has to be a focused desire, a burning desire, a a love, a supreme love. You may not have it, or you may not think you have it, and you may have it, or you may not have it. But you can ask him for that. You may not, you may have, and I know this is the case. There are people that hear this and go, I don't care. I want what my flesh wants. There are people. There are. And I, you know, I could just break down and cry, but I've already done that. So, you know, now I just have to pull it up and go, man, I didn't even know there are people like that. I mean, I've got to face this thing and realize there are people. But even if there are people that go, I don't even care. I, don't, I want what my flesh wants. Those people can say to the Lord, change me. Change me. Can't they? Do you think God hears prayer? He does. Now, a person can go, okay, I'm going to say that. But I really don't want to be changed, but I want to be religious. And I want to say that. Okay? If I was in that place, I was that person, I'd say, well, I don't really want to be changed, but I want to be, you know, I want to move with the religion of the moment and say, change me. But I have no intention of changing even if you move on me. Then I would say to the Lord, I want to be religious. I have no intention of changing if you move on me. So move on me to change me so that I will change so that when you move on me and change me, I will go with it. You know what that is? That may sound weird. What you're doing is peeling back your motives. You're peeling them back till you get down to what's really the case with you. And if you find out it's really bad, you go, hey, help. Do you understand what I mean? You go, you know. But a lot of the, the peelings that we have on top are cover-ups. They're cover-ups. And it's better to peel it down. And see, we say it's not better to peel down because I peeled it down to the, the lowest perimeter. I'm going to find I'm yucky, and I don't want to know that. <laughs> But how are you ever going to get help? And let's say, that, let's say that you think right now, because you've got so much cover over, you've got a broken finger. But if you really peeled it down and you got x-rays and you did all this stuff, that you've got bone cancer that's eating you up all over on the inside, but you can't see a thing of it. Is it, you know what I mean? I think I would want to know at the earliest possible stage and... If I knew the extent of it and got healed, how, how grateful would my heart be forever and ever. But if I never recognized, though it was there, and God healed my finger, I wouldn't be as grateful, would I? I wouldn't recognize how great the Lord is and how great my need is. Therefore, how wonderful the Lord was to do that. So, 
you know, don't hide, you know, don't hide yourself from your own flesh. I'm not speaking to any one person here. Don't hide yourself from your own flesh. You know, be your be your flesh's worst enemy. See, and every one of us have either thoughts from the enemy or carnal, or the carnal mind. The carnal mind is an enemy of God, folks. You know, okay. Now let's do it like this. I said, you know, I mean, I'm just trying to help. I know that's, but let's do it like. This. Okay. Now, there's any number of ways you could approach this. Am I of God? Me, the pastor that's sharing with you, the, the director of the Bible school, am I of God? Am I, am, as what I'm saying from the Lord, uh, and this is where the, you choose one path or another, you know, is the Holy Spirit in any way backing any of this up? And there's a difference of witness in your spirit compared to a war in your mind. Anybody ever experienced that? Most of us at salvation, if no other time. Uh, don't do it, man. You go up there. You know what's going to happen. Man, the Lord's calling you. you know, pretty soon you go, shut up. And you go up. Well, most, you know, some of you experience that in you. Okay. Now, I mean, either I'm telling you the truth or I'm a raven lunatic that all your answers, and, and if we could all lay out everybody's answers to everything, if we just spent another hour, just, okay, now what was your response? Well, that's not really true. Da -da -da -da. I mean, I think that, you know. And so you go, okay, now, I mean, it's either, it, it can be either the pastor sharing from the Lord, and it's the truth, and your thoughts may be carnal, and you need to cast down imaginations and anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Or it could be, well, the pastor means well, but he's a little misguided in some of his statements. Some are right, but a lot of them are off. And, and I'm really just fine. I'm fine. You know, or the pastor is really a wolf and I have eyes and see it. And we need to get rid of this guy. But I can tell you that that what I'm sharing is try, it's, it is the Lord. It is not even Randy. It is not. It is the Lord trying to break through with some people that have been praying and asking for a breakthrough. And I'm, what I'm getting from the Lord, totally not from here, I'm getting from the Lord is that in sharing some of these things, instead of the breakthrough, and he's, a, he's trying his best to answer, you know, but instead of a breakthrough, he's getting walls of resistance because you're going with thoughts that you know are contrary to what he's trying to communicate to you. And, and you're leaning to your own understanding, and because you don't understand, you're not willing to accept that it's true. But the Bible says, lean not to your own understanding. The carnal mind is enmity. But you're not at a place, I guess, to accept that maybe the very thoughts that are countering and the coming and that are filling and that are, you know, and the, that are giving you feelings and condemnings and then anger and then sleepiness and then, you know, uh, doubts and fears and you know, everything but praise God, yes, Lord, <laughs> you know, is... You're not at a point yet, apparently, to accept the good fight of faith. Where you fight with faith and you say, no, these, this is exactly what God has been teaching me. Don't go by this. Don't identify with it. And don't stand against what God's trying to communicate to me by doing that. But join with the Lord. There's no, all the stuff I've shared for the last two services, two classes, none of it rebounds back to Randy. I mean, it's not going to, it's all, it's pretty much an individual dealing. It's just going to put you a step further. It's not, I mean, ultimately, you know, the body, if you do good for one part, it's going to help everybody. But I'm not, there's no personal gain. I just really sense as strong as I can that, that there are some and not, not everybody 
I know that, but I'm not getting that from here. I'm getting that from here. I don't know from here. I can't tell on the, by the looks of your face, you know. Um, Larry told me that he nods his head yes to everything. So, you know, he, I could be, if I went by what I saw, he's totally with me. And, you know, he could be sitting in there going, you're stupid, Randy. You know, I mean, not. You know. <laughs> you know? So I can't. I I don't go by that anyway. But I what I am going by is what I sense from the Lord, and you know maybe maybe with because here we go again. Maybe we should just close out just asking the Lord. You know, you individually, you you go before the Lord and you say, Lord, have I been during this time? Have I been like a reed that's flowing with your Spirit as it blows? Have I been like a st stiff rod that is? not ready to receive your your dealings and I want my own way and then if you admit it if it really was true that you were doing that then say I was doing that I don't want to do that or I want to do it but I want you to move in such a way so eventually I don't want that you see what I mean I mean just keep you, you it's like cards you lay one down okay well you play the next one you outplay that one you know? and another one you out you just keep out playing it you know, I mean, if you see that there are wrong motives or there are wrong, you just keep going, okay, I admit it. Okay, there's no problem here. I see the deal is I'm wrong. Now, Lord, change that. This is apparently the way I really am, but I don't want to stay this way. But if you justify and say, well, I'm not so bad or I wasn't doing anything. Have you ever, has anybody ever seen a kid do that where you, caught them in the act and they said I wasn't doing anything what when you whip them what don't you feel really bad about it because you know that they're not receiving they are feeling un, that, that this is unjust and that you are a wicked person well I'm feeling that somebody thinks I'm unjust and a wicked person because I'm trying to get you to the Lord and I'm not I'm trying to get you to the Lord, and and I just I just feel that wall from the Lord, and I feel the Father really going, hey, tell them I'm for them, tell them I'm with them, I love them, uh, even if they go out of here all messed up and angry or all messed up and justified, I'm still with them, and know this, if I knew who you were, I'm still with you. I've probably known it one time or another, most of you at some juncture and I've still been with you but more importantly the Lord is with you Roger Amen. Amen. We we had a discipleship thing, uh, a class for the culturally deprived here, where we emphasize one of the things about the preeminence of the word above our thoughts, above what we think to insist on that and that's what you're talking about right there to go man I, I love thy word above my own thoughts above my failures this is how I cleanse my way I don't cleanse my way by disavowing the word but the condemnation is we love darkness more than light we should if we're darkness and light shines, we should go, I love light.
But then you know what you find out is that you are truly born again and one with him and you're really not darkness, but you were dwelling now in darkness. You were once darkness, but now you were just dwelling in the darkness of which you came out of, but you weren't fully aware that the change had come. And, that, and to, to receive that is called the renewing of the mind. <laughs> That's how you change from glory to glory. Uh-huh. Amen. Amen. Is there anybody can shed light on maybe um, um, maybe you were going through something and you've seen the Lord you have to whatever degree recognize two things going on and you you know anybody yeah You remember the other day when I was drawing the circles, you know, littler, bigger, 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 and then the cross, and then going back to the Father? I had a few people say to me that that class really helped them to understand the cross like they never did before. In fact, they said, man, now I understand what you've been saying. And, you know, my thought is, I wonder what they understood for the five or six years prior to this when I teach this. And so it comes to me that as, we, as I've taught that you may, you may have an understanding of what you think the Lord's trying to communicate. And what you think might be wrong. In other words, it might be a false cross or a view of, the, of what God's trying to do that's not what he's saying at all. But the way that I discerned my way through things like that was that when I sensed in me something that wasn't Christ, <laughs> while making a stand for Christ, I was willing to start looking real close. Does that make any sense to anybody? When I sensed in me stuff that wasn't Christ, while in the process of quote unquote making a stand I had to go wait a minute wait a minute you know and I knew that some of the junk that rose up in me was not the Lord in relationship to while at the same time but see the Pharisees killed Jesus <laughs> they thought they did God's service you know and so 
So what I began to do is go, I will not back any philosophies or any concepts by a spirit or an attitude that is not Christ. So it must mean there must be something flawed here. There must be. There must be something. That doesn't mean I have to give up everything, but there must be something flawed here. And I need to step back and lay it all out and say, God, put your finger on it. Sick them, Lord. Instead of, instead of continuing forever in that rut, that long rut of, well, and always the same reaction and always the same feelings and always the same thoughts and you know, except for it doesn't always stay the same because the longer you stay there, pretty soon you start getting more resistant and more hard and pretty soon your reactions are worse and then pretty soon you don't want nothing to do with it and, you know. So, yeah, and I can guarantee the Lord isn't hardening you. He may, he, if he moves on you and says, okay, well, this is wrong or that's wrong or whatever, well, the, the knowledge that is from above is, first of all, peaceable. But, you know, I mean, what's that saying, James? You know, is that, is that a good one? But uh, he says, uh, the wisdom that descended from above is, the, the wis this wisdom descended not from above. I guess I need to back up here. Um, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good life his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your heart, glory not and lie not against the truth. Do you see what it's saying? If your heart's full of junk and yet you're claiming, you're claiming the truth, you're lying against it in that sense. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and the word sensual is the word sense realm, or from the soul. And then the next word is properly translated demonical. For where envying and strife are, there is confusion, confusion, and every evil work. And it didn't say, and there's some evil things that will go along with that. Once you open yourself to that, you are open. That doesn't mean every evil work works through you. It just means you are open to every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easily to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruits of righteousness is sown in peace by them that make peace. So I'm saying that if a person were, were totally upset or whatever, God still loves you. He will still continue. His heart is not... If, if there is one little bit of light that shone that brought a sense of guilt or condemnation, don't draw back, but run to Him because He's for you. You're not perfect. You're not. But He is. And He is, he is pure in His ways. And He is able to... You know, he is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And he, and his word will be used to show. He, you see, we want to learn some deep thing in our head so we can think we're spiritual. He sends that word and discerns the thoughts and intents of our heart. And we cover over and put fig leaves over and go, oh, nothing's, nothing's different here, Lord. <laughs> Business as usual in the garden. <laughs> he goes, what? <laughs> What you doing with them there fig leaves on then, son? <laughs> you know. You know. We're the one that covers up. You know, that's Adam. Adam covers up. And God goes, you, you're right. You are right. You know, you need a covering. But it is not of your human works. You need a sacrifice. You, you deserve to die. That sacrifice. Jesus didn't need to die. He died because you needed to die. He took you to the cross and killed you. And now these skins cover you. See, that's what we need to acknowledge, but we're going, well, you know, I ain't so bad, and, you know. And we cover up, and then we make it impossible for him to move on our behalf. And here's the part that really grieves me, is that once we make it impossible for him to move, he can't move, 
So then we get more angry with God, and then we start asking questions like, why isn't God moving? Then we start getting panicky. And we get a little more steeped in our attitude and everything towards him, which ties his hands. And then, you know, and then pretty soon we're way out there in left field. And, of course, I've seen people way out in left field and get so far out that then they're not as hard and then they're not as resistant and then they everything falls apart and they go, if there's a God in any way, shape, or form, come and he comes. <laughs> He's just so good. You know what I mean? He just comes, you know. But the deal is, we don't have to be way out in left field. You are right with God if you say, I'm messed up, I have attitudes, I have reactions, I have emotions that come up, and I don't like it. I don't like it being around me. However, you know, maybe you can even say my spirit isn't even right with you. Make my spirit right with you. Make my spirit right with you. You know, and when these reactions come, don't ever let me be a channel of the devil, of the flesh, of the slime of the old nature. Don't let me be a channel of that to others. You know, do whatever you have to do in the meantime to get me fixed. But I have to warn you, there's probably a chance that he's going to let it out at different times just so that you'll know the very depth of this stuff because it's bad. But where sin abounds, grace, much more. And if you can believe that about your father, then you're going to be all right. I don't really sense the need to pray because we pray all the time. <laughs> I just sense that if you, you know, uh, I, I sense that maybe you need to do your own personal praying. Um, I'll tell you what, I, I don't know, maybe we just need to be led of the Lord here. If you feel like, I'm going to put it like this, if you feel like that there is a resistance in you toward things, even if uh, towards, you sense that resistance. That's all I know how to put it. And you know you need help. Not that you're even saying, oh, I'm perfectly right in my spirit, and I'm, or, or like, oh, I really need help. And I know like you're really in Romans 7 and ready to break through. It may be you just know you need help because I don't even care. <laughs> or maybe maybe you're really getting to a place then that I'd like you to come on up here and stand up here. Praise the Lord. You thought you were all alone, didn't you? <laughs> I must be the worst one here, Lord. Not hardly. We're all the same. We all need the Lord. And that's not, you know... Okay, I, I tell you what, I'll pray some things, and if you feel like agreeing with any of it, then you feel free to do that, okay? Father, for those that just, they don't feel anything, they don't sense anything, they, they just know they need help. They don't know how to get out of anything. They don't even know if they're in anything. They just know they need help. Father, you are a help. And even if, even if you were used and you knew you were being used just to help somebody and they would leave you when it's all over with, I know you so well that it makes no difference to you. You are without partiality and you will be there for them. They don't even know the motives of their own heart. And you do in advance and you still move. 
We love you, Father. I just thank you that you are so beautiful in the way that you are. And for those, Lord, I just ask you to move right now and give them the help, however you see that help to be, because we don't even know. They don't know. They don't know what the need is. They just know they need help. Thank you, Lord. Father, there's some that they recognize and they have signified by coming up here that they're not of the notion to justify wrong attitudes and things. And even though I believe there are they are up here, I believe many of them are up here identifying in Christ. They don't identify with it. They are not of a notion to let it slide to in any way, shape, or form justify it or allow it or to let it know that it's allowed in any way that it is their stance up here is meant to be a visual impression to the enemy, to, to anything uh, contrary, whether it's themselves, that they don't like it, that even if they're identified in Christ, they're making it plain that that's not some sort of a justification some sort of reason to let it go on and carry on. And they're here for you, Lord. They're here to stand with you. Father, may heaven and earth and things under the earth see their stand tonight. May it be a stand that brings your blessing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, there's others that just love you. They just love you. They just love you. And they know they don't know everything. And they don't want to be presumptuous. They just want to be with you. But that's it. I mean, this isn't a stand against the enemy per se. I mean, but it's, they just love you and they just, they just want to follow you. Father, move by your spirit and help them see how to follow you as the good shepherd to where you want them to go. Teach them, Lord that they can trust you. That when you lead them into a place, you let them there. And that you're going to be sufficient. Even though it's going to get tough, it's when it gets tough, and they have no resources, that they will finally lift their eyes in a direction they've never looked before, and they will find you. But Father, it's going to be in the fiery furnace, not wandering the hills picking lilies. Help them not to stand in the field picking lilies waiting for you to change them so that they can go into the fiery furnace. Help them to understand the process, the way that you move. Father, your spirit moves and many, many unique ways. And, and I have to admit, as the, the pastor and as one praying here, that I, I'm i not as sensitive in all the areas that I probably should be. So I just pray generally now for the rest, Lord. My, my ignorance or my lack of sensitivity doesn't stop your very sensitive heart and your very fullness of their condition and their heart towards you. I pray for them, Father, that you will have your way. 
that you have moved on them tonight. You have done that. You have you've called them forward. You've done that. And they responded. And that's good. That's good. And I know that you're pleased. I know that you're pleased because you're making channels out of them more and more. They're getting in the habit of saying yes to you. They're getting in the habit over and over and over of saying yes, and the more times they say yes, you're finding, and they're finding it easier to say yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Oh, thank you, Lord. Father, if there are strongholds, if there are, whether those be man-made through carnal thinking, religion made through the influence of many religious books or, or preachers or whatever, strongholds that are based on demonic activity, On any of these levels of strongholds, Lord, whether carnal, whether religious, whether demonic, for those that will agree, Father, dismantle, dismantle, dismantle right now. We give you permission under your authority, and we submit to your authority, Lord. Jesus, dismantle, dismantle, dismantle. Remove the strongholds, and may the name of the Lord be their strong tower. May they run into you in Christ and there find their safety, and not safety in the security of their false concepts and ideas. Dismantle. We agree, Lord. For all that agree, you will, you hear, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Give them the grace once you begin to dismantle them because there is that place between the security of what they had and the, the uh, insecurity of where they're going. Give them grace in, to make that transition from the dismantling of the strongholds to the building up of the knowledge of the Lord within them. Give them grace during this shaky time. May your angels be there. May your spirit be there to teach them. May others be there for them. May you send supernatural means picking up a book here and reading just what they needed to hear or turning the radio or TV on just at the moment somebody says just what they needed or whatever, Father. You initiate, Father, you initiate, because that's the way you are, not so that flesh becomes secure, that God will take care of flesh, but just because that's the way you are. Thank you, Lord. 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 Hallelujah. Father, I thank you that you love your bride, not because she's smart, not because she has a great IQ, but because she's got a... You love her because of what's in your heart, Jesus, towards her. Jesus, you love her because you love her. Father, may each person here find that connection in their heart with you. More and more may that connection be made from this day forth. And may they not fear, Lord, even the revamping of their mind, per se, the rebuilding that's going on in their mind because in truth, that's just a compartment you are putting in order. 
for their relationship with you is not in you, in their mind. And if their mind is full of evil or full of answers or f that counter the truth or full of uh, good thoughts that are still not the truth, your connection with them is not there. It is in their heart where you've loved them and you have made contact with them initially. And from time to time, they know that and they move based on that. Help them even now at this moment not to fear the muck and the confusion that happens in the mind, but to realize that they are covered. They are covered. They are secure. They are loved regardless that you're not looking for emotional display or mental order, that you love them totally because that's in you to do it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And we receive it not in some emotional way per se. If we feel emotional, good, Father, that's good, but we don't go by that. We don't receive it in some mental way because it's clear. We, we move the mind, the will, the emotions aside, and we just say, I love you, Lord. I love you, Father. I love you, Jesus. And thank you for your love to us. Your gracious, gracious, by grace love towards us. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah.